Greeting citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful creepy human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's true crime video. I'm so happy we could meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow in all of this, today you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Bratterstein, whichever you prefer, and today we're going to be discussing the murder of Melanie Davis. Melanie Davis was murdered in her own bed by her own 15-year-old son, Zach Davis. And then this case went on to get national attention when Zach Davis did an interview with Dr. Phil that ended up being considered one of the most chilling interviews of all time. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure, please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. One of us, one of us, one of us. And you can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. They're all Bratterstein, but no pressure. All right, now that I'm done begging you to join my cult, we can get into this video. Now, this video is actually on a case that I have covered before. I covered this case, I think, man, like when I first started my channel, it's one of the very first videos I've ever done. And at the time that I covered it, I felt like I did a really good job, right? I felt like I really dug deep. And as soon as I learned about the case, it captivated me. It grabbed me. As soon as I saw that interview with Dr. Phil, I was like, what is up with this kid? Because it's very chilling to watch. And, you know, my years on YouTube um, have helped me fine tune my skills, both in video production, but mostly in research as a whole. And I just feel like I could do this case better. I feel like it deserves, um, it just deserves more than I was able to give it at the time. I mean, come on, the last video, the video that I did all those years ago is only like 20 minutes long. And if you know, you know, that's just simply not me. <laughs> so today I'm going to retell you that story. I read all of the things so you do not have to. And at the end of this video, I like to ask a question of the day and I want to give it to you now so you can kind of have it knock it around in your head during the video. But at the end, I want you to answer it. And that is this. Do you believe that Zachary Davis should have been considered guilty or not guilty by reason of insanity? Let me know in the comments below. Now, with all of that said, come gather around and let me tell you the story of the murder of Melanie Davis by her son, Zachary Davis, the boy who was later deemed the sledgehammer killer. So to start this video, we're going to jump in our handy dandy time machine and we're going to head to August 11th, 2012. And this is when the police department in Sumner County received a call from a frantic teenage boy reporting that his house was on fire. So police and firefighters were de dispatched, dispatched to the house. And I can only imagine the scene being total chaos. Police get there and the teenage boy who had made the call informed them that his house was on fire, his mom was inside, and she was in really bad shape. And even though police told the um, first responding firefighters that yes, the house is on fire, but there is a victim inside and there may be a perpetrator inside that actually purposely started this fire and they might want to hold back. The first firefighter on scene, it was a guy named Winton, W-I-N-T-O-N. Um, he said, you know, suspect be damned, I'm gonna run in and try to save this boy's mom. So he goes inside the house and he feels his way through the smoke until he finally finds this boy's mom's bedroom. And when he opens the door and he sees her and sees what he describes as significant damage to her skull, he realizes that she cannot be saved. He says specifically of this, and I quote, I crawled on my hands and knees to do a perimeter search. I found a door that looked like it had been damaged and was cracked open. When I went inside, I noticed bloody footprints going to the closet. I looked under the bed to make sure there was no one hiding. And then on the bed, I found a body. It had significant trauma to the skull. There was no way to resuscitate the victim. It appeared to be blunt force trauma. It did not appear to be a gun wound. At this point, Winton decided to continue searching and he ended up finding himself in a utility room that was right beside the bedroom where he had found the body. And when he went inside this room, he found a bloody sledgehammer. So at this point he left, he contacted the police and he's like, Hey, I think I found a murder weapon. Now the body in the room was that of 45 year old Melanie Davis and her son, 15 year old Zach Davis was missing. 
Melanie Davis, who was described as a very, very good mother, was born Melanie Herman, and she was an Aust Austrian citizen who left her home country once she was old enough to do so and moved to America, where she married a man named Chris Davis there and making her Melanie Davis. The two went on to have two children, both boys. Uh, first was a baby boy named Joshua, followed a year later by another baby boy named Zachary, born July 27th, 1997, making him Elite. Now, there isn't much known about the couple's early years or about the boys even. This isn't a case that has a ton of information out there. I was able to see that they made a home for themselves in Kentucky and that they were a nice all-American family, you know, middle class, home, good neighborhood, blah, blah, blah. All the things that we always hear when we don't really know that much. Um, and it sucks because you know, if you know, I really, this is like the point where I like to really give you a lot of um, context and backstory on the couple and the boys and what growing up for them was like, but the information just isn't there. The one thing I was able to find and something that does matter, um, like is relevant to our case, is that tragedy struck the family in 2007. And this would have been when Josh and Zach were like 10, 11, around that age range. And this is when their father, Chris, died at the age of 44 from Lou Gehrig's disease. And I had to look it up at the time, at the time, like the first time I did this video, I looked it up and it is such a gnarly disease. Basically, it's like a super rare disorder where it attacks your like nerve cells. I'm not a doctor, please God, if I'm not explaining it correctly, um, don't roast me, but I guess it attacks your nerve cells and it basically makes your muscles deteriorate and then you die. And it just sounds, it sounds like a very gnarly way to go. And I can't even imagine how hard it would be to watch the person you love go through something like that. Like I feel for Melanie so hard because I guess they were together like 20 years. And then for her to just, I mean, which would have made her like 25 when they got together, 24, 25. Like that's so heartbreaking to have to have the person that you love, that you marry, you have kids with, just die like that. It's so young. 44 is hella young. The older I get, the younger that seems. And so I can only imagine how hard it was for her and also how hard it was for the boys because they were seemingly close with their dad. He was the type of dad who would like play video games with them and just super be super close. They seem to be close from what I can see online with not knowing them. So his loss seems like it was likely a very large blow to this family. Now, Zach did not deal with losing his father. Well, I don't think anyone would right? But he seemed to be taking it particularly hard. And it got so bad that his mother thought that he may benefit from some therapy to see if the types of things that he was experiencing and what was going on with him was normal. Now, in the process of evaluating him and doing the whole mental health check, it was found that some of what he was going through was normal, um, but not all of it. He was suffering from pretty bad depression, which I mean, of course he was. He just lost his dad at freaking uh, the ripe age of like 10 years old. Like that's pretty messed up. He might've been nine, nine, 10 young, right? Formative years. But on top of that, he was hearing disembodied voices, particularly the disembodied voice of his late father. So that's not good. That's not what you want to hear. And from this, he ended up being diagnosed with a depressive di depressive disorder and psychosis um, at the age of 11, which is very young for that. And it seems though that Zach was already struggling with some mental health stuff prior to his father's death and that maybe this just exasperated it a little bit because there were um, reports like in his mental health file, his permanent record, if you will, that said that even before his dad died, he was already obsessed with death and that he had reportedly been cutting his wrists, like been a cutter, um, before his dad had even died as well. And that his mom had found out and had threatened to send him, send him to a mental health facility if he did not stop. Around the same time in, um, Zach's life, it was said that Melanie was worried about him at least a little bit. She had brought to his therapist's attention that he was drawing some like weird pictures, you know, some stuff that made her raise her eyebrow a little bit, drawings of people getting blown up or having their heads cut off, like violent drawings. Um, so that was also in his permanent record. And it also stated, but did not explain why, that Zach had been on Zoloft, but that Melanie had taken him off the Zoloft. 
Another thing that is stated but not explained is that Zach had been in therapy, right? He was working on getting some help. He was taking medication. He was no longer taking medication. And after that, Melanie took him out of therapy. And I'm not sure why that happened. There could be a millions, million, there could be millions. There could be tons. <laughs> there could be a lot of reasons is what I'm trying to say as to why she did this. Um, we don't know. She's not here to explain herself, but she took him out of therapy. And this would prove to be a problem, hence why we're here today, because Zach was working on getting better. He had gone through some of the, you know, steps in the grieving process, and he was going through the motions of trying to improve his mental health, but he hadn't quite gotten to the state of recovery yet when he was pulled out. So now Melanie is totally alone, right? Like she is a new single mother of two teenage boys. She's in addition to being the only parent, she's now the only provider. So she needs to balance somehow being good at all of those things, being um, sufficient at all of those things and being able to take care of herself. She's doing a job as a paralegal, which is an incredibly stressful job. As you guys know, I was a legal assistant and a paralegal for years and it is a stressful job on top of like two teenage boys. I can't, I cannot even imagine that. So she was trying to do that while also trying to make time for herself. And she started taking up running as a hobby and she even became a triathlete. Like she was really good at it, but you know, she's dealing with all of that, all of that newness, all of that new um, soul responsibility while also dealing with the loss of her husband, who is likely the love of her life. I mean, 20 years is a long time. Even if you hate your husband, right? If you're together for 20 years, you've worked your life out around them. Like every plan for your future, for your present, every single thing that you've ever seen your life becoming involves this person. All the choices you've made were involving this person. So now she's doing all of that without him, which seems incredibly hard. But from those who knew her, it seemed like she was doing well at, at balancing this and that there was harmony in the home. And she was determined to make sure they continue to do well. And she wanted to just, you know, get a fresh start, get away from all of the shit, right? Like leave the past behind and start fresh somewhere new where hopefully they could all just be happy and start the next chapter that they were being forced to, to do now that their father was gone. So she decided to move and they moved from Kentucky to Sumner County, Tennessee to start their new lives. And hopefully, I mean, obviously since we're here today. It didn't go the way she was expecting, but she was hoping that this would be the right move for her and her sons. But I mean, what she didn't know is that Zach was a lot worse than she clearly thought he was. Cause if she thought he was as bad as he actually was, she would have left him in therapy. You know what I mean? Like nobody expects their, their children to do the things that Zach goes on to do. Under the surface, things were not going tight with Zach. He was becoming dark and distant. He wore a hoodie every day, pulled over his head, and he didn't really have any friends at Station Camp High School where both he and his brother went. And where prior to his father's death, he was considered a good student. Like he had good grades, he loved history and he loved literature, but you know, not math like most kids. Um, but one classmate said that Zach often refused to speak in his regular voice and almost always responded in a whisper when being spoken to. And the same student actually came out and said that Zach wore like the same hoodie every single day that he didn't like change his clothes, which like sounds like a dig, but same. And I mean like same like hoodie. I'm not wearing like the same underwear. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, okay, okay, move it on, move it on, move it on. Later, after all the things had happened, after it was too late for anything to be changed, you know, uh, one of Zach's guidance counselors was interviewed and said that Zach was one out of like the multitude of students. Um, there was like a handful of students who concerned this guidance counselor and Zach was one of them. He was just like one of those kids who was into dark, creepy shit, right? And that always makes people be like, ah, obviously there was something wrong with him. Like, okay, he was really into to murder, serial killers, torture. He had like two apps on his phone that were, that explored 
those subjects, which first off, what are those apps? I do not know. I couldn't find the names of the apps, but I am curious. Um, and he was into like horror movies and video games that you would consider violent. And he really liked Stephen King. And on the front of his notebook, it said, you can't spell slaughter without laughter, you know, just like dark shit. And here's the thing. Some people are going to be like, whoa, those are some red fucking flags. How did she not notice it? How did anybody not notice it? But the thing is, is when I hear that, that's not really where my brain goes. I don't consider liking dark stuff um, in isolation to be something that is worrisome. It's, it, to me, it sounds like um, normal, albeit a bit ridiculous emo little boy bullshit, right? Like, I feel like it sounds like every kid that I knew in high school, <laughs> just like sad emo boy, interested in dark shit. And if those are the types of things that make somebody look bad, like if you were to look at me in high school, I'm not looking much better than Zach. And yet I sit here never having killed anyone. So there's more to it than just that. But that's what people like to cling to. So now we're going to fast forward a little bit and we're at the day of the murder. Okay. It was August, 2012. Zach, his brother and his mom actually had like a really nice day together. They went out together. They spent some quality time. They went and saw a movie. I, it was called the campaign, which I believe is like a comedy with Will Ferrell, which how are you going to do what he goes on to do after watching a just light in this world like Will Ferrell, but okay. And the three came home and everything seemed normal. But when they got back, Zach went in his room and started to pack a bag, a weird bag, one containing his notebooks, his diary, clothing, a toothbrush, all normal overnight stuff. But then you add a ski mask, gloves, a claw hammer, the type of bag that one might use to do something not so great. I'm trying to think of like an innocent thing one could do with the contents of said bag, but I'm kind of drawing a blank here. Josh went to bed that night at about 10 p.m. and his mother had gone to bed about an hour before him at 9 p.m. having no idea what her youngest son, her literal baby, was planning to do to her. After the two went to bed, Zach stayed up. He stayed up kind of hanging out in his room hanging out in the living room. And after about two hours, two hours after his mom went to bed at 11 PM, he walked into the family's garage and he retrieved a sledgehammer. Later saying that he chose the sledgehammer specifically because he would have a greater chance of not missing. Zach then walked to his mother's bedroom. He says that he stood outside the bedroom door a while, not really thinking, not really doing anything. But finally he entered her room where he just stood above her watching her sleep for a while, which is just fucking frightening when you picture it, him standing there in the dark with a sledgehammer. Like it's, it's, I can't, he says he stood there. And then finally he decided he was going to kill her. And it's at this point that he beat his mother to death in her sleep with a sledgehammer. He said that he raised it like really like, like this, like really intensely so that he would make sure he got the strength and the momentum to really, really hurt her. And he hit her in the head somewhere between 10 and 20 times. He said that after the first hit, she did wake up and she started seizing. And he says that he looked into her eyes, but that she did not look back at him. He said after a certain amount of time, he grabbed a pillow and he held it over her face because he didn't like to hear the gurgling sounds. And he also wanted to make sure that he kept her quiet so that she would not wake up his brother. After he was done with what he had done, he walked out of her room covered in blood from head to toe, as I'm sure you can imagine because of what he, because it's like a mat. Mm. Mm -mm. And he locked her bedroom door behind him. The DA on this case said of this murder, and I quote, I don't think I've ever seen a case this brutal committed by this young of a person. I've had several brutal cases, but this was one of the worst. Zach then left his mother's bedroom and he headed to the family's game game room, which he intended on setting on fire. He covered it in accelerants, um, which were whiskey and I believe gasoline and set it on fire, um, before walking out and closing the door and then leaving the home, um, fully intending for the house to catch on fire and burn his brother to death while alive. That was his plan. Um, and destroy all evidence, like all in one fell swoop. So he's like, I'm going to set this house on fire. It's going to cover all the evidence. That I'm the one who did it. 
It's going to kill my brother. He's going to burn alive. That's great. Now I'm on my way. So he leaves the house, um, you know, going down the road on the way he ditches his cell phone. He like throws it in a ditch and he takes off his bloody t-shirt and he throws it behind a market along his way. And both of these things were later retrieved by police. After leaving his burning home, he stopped in at like a, like a gas station liquor store type situation where he purchased either two diet Pepsis or two Cokes. Um, it, it depends on what article you read, uh, what drink he drank, but I think there's an important distinction there. Cause I don't know. I just can't picture, picture like a 15 year old boy being like a, a diet Coke, no, a diet Pepsi type boy. Like, is he really a medium popcorn, no bad butter and a small diet Pepsi type of boy? Like I can't really see that being the case, but either way, he picked up two soft drinks and he also picked up a map of Tennessee and the clerk at the, the store where he bought these things said that he appeared to have blood on his pants and made her feel very uncomfortable. And a video like the surveillance video of him going into the store after killing his mom and trying to kill his brother was recovered and shown to the jury at trial. Now, fortunately for Josh, but unfortunately for Zach, for his purposes, um, he had closed the door of the family game room and in doing so he had made it. So the fire wasn't able to spread as quickly as he had hoped because it didn't have the oxygen from the door being open for it to do it. Because fires need oxygen just like the rest of us. So because of this, Josh wasn't killed right away and he was woken up by the sound of the fire alarm. So he got up in a panic because I'm sure you can imagine your house is on and fire. And he ran to his mom's room and he found that the door was locked. So he's tried banging on the door. She didn't open it. So he broke the door down. And that's when he found what I can only imagine is a horrifyingly traumatizing sight. He then ran out of the house and he called the police. I never saw anything in any reporting that he even tried to save his brother. I don't know if that's accurate, but I just didn't see anything that said that he did. But I mean, maybe he just knew in his guts. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So while Zach's on his way into the night, you know, ditching his cell phone, ditching his shirt, buying his soda and his freaking map, police are back at his house processing the scene, realizing there's been a murder and realizing that he is missing. So they're searching everything and they end up finding like a kitchen knife. I believe it was a butcher's knife um, by the back door of the house. And it was tested and it was determined that this was not used during the crime. And later Zach was asked about this, like, yo, what was up with that knife? outside the door, my guy. And he told police that he had planned to bring it with him in case anyone tried to stop him or got in his way. But that when he heard the fire alarm go off, he got scared and he just ran. And that makes me so uncomfortable because that means that he fully intended to hurt other people if it came to it. So that's not good. Though Zach ran off, you know, he tried to evade capture. He tried to get out of there. Uh, it didn't take police long to find him. He was found just like five hours later at 6.15 in the morning and just under 10 miles away from home. So he didn't really get very far. And he was discovered just like walking down a two lane road, two lane road. And apparently the guy that found him was a guy named Chris. Mr. Chris is what we will call him. And he was like a county deputy, but also a resource officer at Zach's school, actually. When Zach was taken into custody, when he was located, he was found with a backpack and a satchel and also just pockets just filled with shit. Inside his pocket, they found a pocket knife, an X-Acto knife, his station camp high school ID, earplugs, a cigarette lighter, tissues, and a set of keys. And then later when his backpack and uh, satchel were searched, they found several changes of clothing, a claw hammer, a flashlight, four cans of tuna, gloves, a ski mask, several screwdrivers, a hunting knife, a box of razors, and several notebooks. And one of these notebooks contained a letter written by Zach confessing to the murder. Among other things, this letter said, and I quote, I killed Melanie and left Josh alive to suffer. I didn't feel anything when I killed her. Even when her blood splattered my arm and her brain matter was thrown onto my shirt. He continued, I didn't feel remorse, hate, or even satisfaction. My only true regret was that I wasn't able to give her a faster death. I didn't want her to suffer. So when the first officer came upon Zach, he, you know, he stopped him, but then he called for backup right away because he doesn't know what he's dealing with here. And so backup comes, he's put in a patrol car and the officer noted that he was super, super quiet and he didn't say anything. So when Zach was interviewed, um, he, first off, he was interviewed alone because, um, 
Even though he was a minor, he didn't have any living parents or guardians. And his family that was in the States, in Kentucky, was estranged. And his other grandparents were in Austria. So he didn't really have anyone who could like sit in with him while he was questioned. Um, but I guess during the questioning, he was super polite and kind and courteous and he answered all their questions. But he was reluctant to give police um, any sort of motive or real explanation for why he did what he did. But he did confess. He was interviewed for an hour and the whole thing was videotaped and he completely confessed that he did do it. He even said that he thought about using the claw hammer or the knife to kill his mother, but he chose the sledgehammer ultimately because he knew he'd be the most successful with that. And he also stated, uh, he's just, he stated something that's so chilling. He said that when he killed his mother, he laughed, but he said he didn't know why he laughed because he didn't feel anything when he did it. He also told police that if he could go back he would have still done it. He said that he didn't regret doing it, that if he could go back in time, he would have still done it. He would have still killed her. The only thing he would have done differently is that he would have killed his brother with the sledgehammer as well, since the fire hadn't done the job. So Zach was arrested, as I'm sure you can imagine, <laughs> and he was charged with first degree murder and um, attempt to commit first degree murder against his brother and also aggravated arson. And he was sent to a juvenile facility to await trial. Zach was assigned a public defender as, you know, you are legally, that is your right if you can't afford an attorney, right? Right. And his attorney released a statement after his arrest stating, and I quote, as devastating as is the senseless loss of life, this case is even more tragic for the simple fact that Zach is also a victim here. After Zach Davis's father died in his presence of a degenerative illness, being moved and isolated from extended family, Zach sent up every possible red flag a nine-year-old is able to articulate that he was depressed, disturbed, and sliding into a chasm of despair and frustration. And yet he was failed at every turn by the school system, the child welfare system, the family, and society. Zach Davis is truly lost in the system. So while Zach was in jail awaiting trial. This is when he was reached out to, or I don't exactly know how um, they got from the A to the D, like what the B and C was of it. Okay. But <laughs> that's a quote from Hollow Man. I'm sorry. I don't know how the interview came to be, but Zach was going to be interviewed by Dr. Phil. And this happened about two months before his trial. And Dr. Phil, along with like a crew member, camera, people, all that shit um, of eight different people all showed up and they ended up meeting him in a empty courtroom that was next to the Sumner County Jail. And in this interview, I've got to be honest, this kid's pretty terrifying. I understand why it got to be so popular once people saw him speak because he makes the hair on your arms like stand on end. He's very disconnected. He's very off. He's got the, vi he's got a hardcore, and I saw this comment a lot in my initial video, but he's got a very hardcore sling blade vibe. If you've seen that movie, um, he speaks very slow and with this, he has the deepest fucking voice. He's got the deepest voice ever. It's so deep. It's like crazy deep. And he speaks very slow and he nods his head really like aggressively and he smiles to himself and he chuckles to himself. And it's always while being asked or describing horrible things like how heavy the sledgehammer was and what it sounded like when it hit his mother's skull. He like laughed to himself when he thought back on it, which is just such a weird thing. And he was asked why he did what he did. And he said that his mother wasn't taking care of him and his brother and he was tired of it. During this interview, Dr. Phil asked him like, why that day? What made that day the day for you? And he just said he didn't know. He just thought it seemed like a good time. And he was asked like, why he hit his mother so many times because he hit her so many times like overkill right like it doesn't take a lot to kill a person with a sledgehammer and he just said he wanted to make sure that she was dead and it's just so unsettling that's so rude and it's honestly just like wildly chilling because he's talking about his own mother and this is after being arrested and like the reality of what he had done sinking in, you know, it's separated some, some time between him and the event. And still, this is how he's responding. And that to me is like the creepiest part is when people feel nothing, even after being out of the adrenaline filled moment of what they've done. And Dr. Phil asks him like, okay, so you killed your mom. And he's like, yeah. 
And he's like, why did you kill your mom? And he's like, oh, she wasn't taking care of the family, right? And he's like, by the family, you mean like you and your brother? And he's like, yeah. And he's like, okay, here's the thing. Here's my question. Like, if you didn't think she was taking care of the family, why did you kill her? Why did, did you think about having a conversation with her? Like bringing it up being like, hey, do you think maybe you could take better care of us or something? And he was like, I didn't think it would do any good. And Dr. Phil's just like, okay, so you didn't think talking to her would do any good, so you just killed her instead. And he's like, yeah. And then he goes on to say like that, he goes on to imply that it wasn't a planned thing, that it was just like, he woke up that day and was like, you know what, I think I'm just gonna kill her out of, out of nowhere, that he just like woke up and wanted to do it and did it the very first day that the thought popped into his head. Dr. Phil said to him at this point, quote, I need you to help me understand here. You're standing outside her bedroom door. You've got a sledgehammer in one hand. You've got your hand on the doorknob with the other. And you open that door. Like, what's going through your head at that moment? And he just said that he didn't remember, that his mind was just pretty much a blank. He said he looked into her eyes and that she didn't look back at him. And Dr. Phil asked him if he was sorry that his mother was dead. And he said that, yes, he was. And when he asked, like, why he was sorry, Zach just said that he felt sorry for doing it. That was it. That's his, that's his whole spiel. It's just like a lot. And this interview was because, you know, the interview happened two months before his trial. This interview was shown to the jury, which definitely didn't help him at all. Anyone who knew the family thought this was so weird. Like it was such a shock because everyone said Zach and his mom were super close that like they, they even checked like his cell phone and her cell phone after the murder. And in the days leading up to the murder, up until the point that he killed her, there was nothing in their phones that showed there was anything wrong. They were texting like nicely back and forth, just sending normal mother son text messages. So it took a bit for the trial to take place, but once it finally did, Zach was tried as an adult. He had been initially held in a juvenile facility, but the juvenile facility had deemed that because of his significant emotional and mental problems, there wasn't anything that they could really do to assist him in like they, they, basically that what they were saying is that they couldn't help him, that the murder was so savage and brutal that they didn't feel like putting him in a juvenile facility or having him tried as a juvenile would be like a valid option for his crime. And I guess while he awaited trial, um, cause he was sent to criminal, criminal court. So he was put in an adult prison. And I guess while he was awaiting trial, he was in solitary confinement and he was in solitary confinement for like 24 hours out of the day. Cause I guess like if you, I don't know if this is every state, but if you are a minor in an adult prison in this state, in this County, you're held in solitary confinement, I guess, for your protection. And so Zach would stay in his solitary confinement cell like all day, I guess he was allowed out for like an hour a day. And he said he didn't really care. Like, he's like, I don't really care about being in solitary. Like I'd be all right if I was let out around other people, but I don't really mind being in solitary anyway. But I don't know. I feel like maybe that's not totally accurate because I he didn't seem to be especially happy in prison. Like he was given medication for his mental health issues while in jail and he started hoarder, hoarding, hoarding his pills basically. And he tried to take his own life at one point. And um, it doesn't surprise me to hear that he was a little bit suicidal because he also asked his attorney to try to get him the death penalty. So he clearly didn't want to be around it anymore. Zach's trial ended up getting delayed like several times first because they were trying to, his mental health and his me mental competency was a big subject of conversation and still is. Um, so that took a little bit to kind of figure out if he was going to be competent to stand trial, ETC, which we're going to get into shortly. But another reason that his trial was like delayed a bit was because he actually ended up assaulting a prison guard while he was in jail. I guess this guy was named Mr. Uh, Mr. Morris. We're going to call him Mr. Morris. It was something Morris, guard Morris. Officer Morris was watching Zach like he was the guard in charge of watching him at this particular time when Zach attacked him and it resulted in this guard getting a concussion and Zach being charged with aggravated assault. Now, why did he do this? That's really the question. The answer, I don't know. It could be during this time when this happened, he was in solitary confinement and he was only even able to like video chat with his grandparents who were now his legal guardians now that his mother was dead and his father was dead. Um, and he was only able to talk to them on video chat like every other week. So that could have had something to do with it. Maybe the isolation finally caught up with him. Um, but I also think it's worth mentioning that this happened on July 29th, which was actually his 17th birthday. So I think maybe he 
could have been feeling extra emotional on this particular day. I'm really not sure. Anyways, his competency. Let's just get into that now since I just brought it up. So basically he had two competency hearings. One was when he was in the juvenile court and then another was when he was in the criminal court once it was deemed that he was going to be tried as an adult. Dr. Sandra Phillips, who was a forensic psychologist who interviewed Zach like 30 times, like she interviewed him a shit ton of times, and it equated to about nine hours of um, interview time between the two of them, she said of Zach, and I quote, he was strange. He was very quiet, extremely polite, and almost always looked down. Almost all who came in contact with him that I talked to said he was extremely strange and out of touch with his emotions. When she spoke with Zach, she said that he didn't trust her. He had a really hard time trusting her and that it took him a long time of her interviewing him for, e for him to even tell her that he was hearing voices because he just didn't trust to her enough to give her the information, which made it hard for her to evaluate him. She said that she, she was like really thorough. She spoke to not, not just Zach, but a lot of people in his life. She spoke to his grandmother, to some of his teachers, like a guidance counselor, a social studies teacher, um, jail personnel. She spoke to like all of these people to try to get a full picture of Zach and his conditions. She said that each time she evaluated Zach, she came to the same conclusion, and that was that he was not competent to stand trial. She also stated that he was delusional and that he was suffering from psychosis and that he had been hearing voices for quite some time, and she didn't believe that he was faking it. She said that he was way too consistent with everything that he said and all of the mannerisms and the way that he acted, and that he didn't seem like he was exaggerating any of his conditions. And that's something that you might see in somebody who was faking it to make themselves seem more sick than they are. She also said that Zach was autistic and suffered from extreme depression. And she also said that he had PTSD and not PTSD from his father's death, but actually PTSD from a rape allegation that he, that he claimed happened, which we're going to get into later. That's something that we're going to discuss. And the doctor said that because, okay, the whole rape thing, it was determined that this didn't happen, but she said because Zach was delusional, he truly believed it happened and therefore he had PTSD from something that seemingly didn't actually even happen to him. She said that he essentially had no coping skills on top of all of that because he didn't have any friends, so he just internalized everything that he was feeling and that the line between his emotions and his thoughts ran very deep. And she said that she has never met a single person as detached from their emotions as Zach is. Another doctor who evaluated Zach um, agreed with the first doctor saying that Zach, you know, had depression and also said that he was showing symptoms of like extreme schizophrenia. He said that Zach was delusional, just like the previous doctor, and that he was still suffering delusions while in jail. He was convinced that the guards or the other inmates were out to get him, to rape him or to kill him. And he would like during their sessions freak out and like wonder if there was somebody in the, the vents or if somebody was watching him. I guess Zach even went as far as like getting a weapon in jail and he said that he wanted it to defend himself in case somebody tried to attack him, in case one of the guards specifically tried to attack him, even though he admitted himself that like nobody had actually ever tried to hurt him, but he was always worried that one of them would try to hurt him, torture him, or rape him. He also told this doctor about the voices that he heard and that he heard the voice of his dead father. He said that occasionally his dad would tell him to do things just like when he told him to kill his mother, but that mostly there, the voice was just conversational. He said he did have other voices in his head though that would criticize him or insult him, but these were voices that he didn't recognize. Now, obviously there were also doctors that testified for the prosecution and mostly they just disagreed with the, um, determinations of the defense's doctors, or alternatively, they would say, okay, yeah, all of that's true. All that's great. He's sick. He's got schizophrenia. Cool. But that doesn't mean he's not legally competent for what he did because he clearly knew right from wrong at the time that he committed the murder. And the judge basically said that the testimony from the defense's counts, uh, defense's mental health experts and the prosecution's mental health experts basically just canceled each other out. So it wasn't really helpful for him to determine whether or not Zach was competent to stand trial. And the determining factor ended up being Zach testifying himself, like his own words is what helped the judge make a decision. 
The judge noted that Zach seemed to be able to recall and recount where he had been since his arrest and what roles each person present at the trial played in the the grand scheme of things in the trial, which is something that you need to be able to do in order to be considered competent. He was able to tell his attorney what had happened and why he had done it, what he did, and really that's all you need to do. That's all you need to be competent to stand trial, to be able to understand and assist in your defense, among other things. But as long as he was understanding and able to assist in his defense, so with that, the judge decided that Zach was competent to stand trial, and from there, the trial moved forward. Now, once the trial began, Zach pleaded not guilty due to reason of insanity. And if that is confusing, because we just went over the whole mental health thing at length, being competent to stand trial is one thing, and pleading not guilty due to insanity is another. Because basically, competency is, are you capable of handling a trial right now and helping your attorney so that you have a fair trial? And what, what he's pleading, 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 whatever, he's saying he's not guilty because he was not mentally, legally responsible for the crime. So that's the difference there. Because I used to be confused about that until I started reading a million and one true crime cases. And then it kind of, you know, you read enough, you, you, you learn, you learn, you live and you learn. Yeah. Zach's attorney claimed that a mental defect rendered him incapable of being able to basically he said like he wasn't mentally capable of premeditating this crime and that the prosecution hadn't proven beyond a reasonable doubt that the murder was premeditated because that's what the um, prosecution was trying to say is that he planned this in advance and he did this boom there it is and his defense attorney said of this and i quote he said he did it i don't think there's any question about that but that doesn't mean he's guilty of the crimes. The defense tried to prove that Zach was mentally ill, that he was hallucinating at the time that he committed the murder, that he was hearing the voice of his dead father telling him to kill his mother, and that because of all of that, he wasn't mentally there enough to be legally responsible for the crimes that he was being accused of committing. And his grandma, I think it was on his dad's side, testified um, for Zach at the trial saying that Zach wasn't evil, that he wasn't a bad kid, and that Zach's like therapist prior to the murder had said that he was suffering from delusions and that that is what caused him to do what he did. His attorney really just did the best he could. He said like from the beginning that he saw the prosecution's case and was like, that's like one of the strongest cases I've ever seen against somebody, right? Um, and he knew it was an uphill battle from the beginning, but he did like the best he could. He, she, they did the best they could with the case they were given. Now the DA called bullshit on all of this, called bullshit on the whole mental health aspect in general, saying that Zach didn't even mention to any psychiatrist that he had heard the voice of his father until after he had his hearing at the juvenile court and was switched over to the criminal court. But you recall um, that the therapist said that Zach didn't trust them enough to say it sooner, ETC, ETC. And in addition to that, there was a search on, I believe it was Zach's phone. It was some electronic device in the household back on August 4th. So before the murders, obviously, um, searching for paranoid schizophrenia. So either someone in the house was worried that he had it, was looking into it, he was looking into it because he was worried he had it. Or I guess you could argue that he was looking into it to see what the symptoms were so that he could pretend like he had it. The prosecution also argued that even if Zach was mentally ill, and I feel like most people believe that he is, that he's still legally responsible for what he had done because he knew what he was doing at the time that he did it was wrong. And he had taken steps to also conceal what he did. Like his intent was to murder his mother and he had done just that. And in addition to that, he also took steps to like hide what he did after the fact. He got rid of his phone. He got rid of his bloody clothes. He, he packed a bag and he ran. And on, in addition to that, he said he chose the sledgehammer specifically because he knew it would be the most successful tool at finishing the job. And on top of that, when they looked through those notebooks and those diaries, it showed that he had been planning this for some time. Like he'd been writing about it days before he actually did it. Speaking of this diary, there was something else found in the diary um, that sort of gave a motive to, for why Zach may have done what he did. Basically, in this diary, it said that his older brother had started sexually abusing him when they moved to Tennessee. Now, again, the psychiatrist said, again, backtrack, 
this was proven not to be true, which I already stated. And the psychiatrist said that this was the type of thing that Zach just truly believed happened. But Zach wrote that it happened, and he wrote that he had wanted to kill his brother ever since. He wrote that, that he told his mom and that she didn't believe him. And so that's why he went on to do what he did, that he killed his mother with the sledgehammer so that it would be fast because he didn't want her to suffer. But then he set the house on fire so his brother would burn alive because that would be a worse death. Of course, his brother, who, by the way, during the entire trial, he sat behind Zach. He sat behind Zach um, on his side, on his team, you know, like they never spoke to each other. Like he just sat behind him and they never communicated with each other, but he was there showing support for his brother, even though that had to have been such a difficult thing to do. But his brother, when he was talked to about this, he was like, that's fucking ridiculous. Like that may, that, that definitely did not happen. And I guess the police looked into it and CPS was brought in and looked into it and it was found to not be true. And Zach's credibility was kind of shot when, well, for one, he contradicted himself like crazy. He went on the Dr. Phil show and he gave a totally different reason saying that his mother wasn't taking care of the family and just his overall behavior and mannerisms in court, laughing at weird times and just being super inappropriate didn't make him seem like a very trustworthy person. When Josh was asked about all of this, he said like, he was so confused because his family was close. He and his mom were close. His brother and his mom were close. He and his brother were close that he loved his brother, but not like that. And that it never happened. And when like, he was asked like, what do you think? Uh, like, do you think it's ridiculous that he said this? He's like, well, no shit. Obviously it's ridiculous. Like what kind of question, like what kind of question is that? Obviously it is like, I had no idea anything like this was going to happen. Me, my mom, and my brother just went out the day that he killed her, had a great time, saw a movie everything was fine. Everything was normal. And now I'm here and my mom's dead and my brother's saying I raped him and I'm filled with confusion and sadness. And this is bullshit. You know, like, fuck, I feel so bad for this guy. I feel so bad for this guy. Oh, his poor brother, man. It's like his, it's like Zach literally threw him over, threw him under the bus at every chance he got. Okay. He even went as far as completely bamboozling his own attorney mid trial. So his attorney like put him up on the stand and started questioning him. And Zach, completely changed his story on what happened and was like, actually, here's the thing. I didn't even do it. My brother did. It was such a shit show. He was like, just being questioned by his attorney when out of nowhere, he's like, actually, here's the thing. I didn't do it. My brother did it. And I took the blame for it. And his attorney was like stunned into silence for several seconds. And then finally it was like, uh, okay, then. So what did your brother do? And he was like, oh, my brother killed her with the sledgehammer. And then I found out about it. And then I just took the blame. And his attorney was like, you literally, you literally told everyone here that you were the one who did it. You realize that, right? And he's like, yeah, I know, but I didn't. And I took the blame and now it just doesn't feel worth it to cover for him anymore. He then sort of changed it again, saying that like he thought he did it, but then he looked at the evidence and he realized it wasn't actually him. He was like, okay, I did get the sledgehammer and I did hit her once, but she was okay when I left. So Josh must've came in after the fact and got the sledgehammer and finished her off. So he's the one who killed her. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like who, like, what was he trying to accomplish with this? You know, the DA, the DA thought that he was trying to do something sneaky and said that he believed basically that this was a strategic move on Zach's part. And he said specifically of this, and I quote, I think he's a lot smarter than we're giving him credit for. And I think he thought he could get out of this because maybe the jury would think he was nutso if he said he didn't do it. He has a flat effect, but he's very intelligent. He really wanted to be a serial killer. It was one of the most unusual cases we've ever had. Anyways, his attorney, Randy was like, Oh, uh, like what the fuck am I supposed to do? I guess this guy had been a defense attorney for 30 years and had never once had a client change their story while on the stand like that. So he was trying to get the judge to declare a mistrial because his client had basically just, um, made his entire defense fucking pointless at this point. And the judge was like, I'm sorry, like sucks to suck, but I'm not going to do that because letting a defense attorney call a mistrial because their client changes their story on the stand could be a dangerous precedent for future cases. Cause then anybody could be like, Oh, I'm just gonna change my story. Mistrial. Let's do this all. I could do this all day. Winston, I could do this all day. So his attorney's like, well, shit, that's not good. So he's like, okay, well, can I have his competency reevaluated? Cause clearly something's wrong with him. Cause who the fuck would do what he just did? And the judge is like, it's going to be a no from me, dog. Please continue with your defense. 
Zachary's grandma, I mentioned before, but she was like a real advocate for Zach and his mental health. And she believed that he wasn't responsible and that if he had gotten the help he needed, we wouldn't be in the situation we were in and none of this would have happened. She said that she had brought up Zach's behavior to Melanie before his zombie like state and his catatonic state, as she said, and that Melanie had just like kind of brushed it off saying that her son was just quiet like she was. Zach's grandmother said of the whole situation, and I quote, every teacher, every guidance counselor should have to stand trial with Zach. Zach is not a monster. He's just a child who made a horrible mistake. A child who was shown crime scene photos of his mother after being hit in the head with a sledgehammer more than 10 times. A child who saw his mom's blood soaked sheets, blood all over her body, her hands like folded over her chest. Okay. Saw some horrible things and showed no emotion. So I think that's very scary. They described the crime scene while showing photos in great detail and he didn't react at all. And I don't know if it's denial or if it's, if she really believes, here's the thing. I don't think that grandma liked Melanie very much. That's the vibe I got. I could be wrong. I, obviously I could be wrong. I don't know them, but that is the vibe I got. She is on record as saying like that Melanie failed to help Zach, failed to get him help for his depression when his father died. And she told the court, like, I don't want Zach to get forgotten here today. Like he has most of his life, which seems like a dig to me at Melanie a little bit. I did read that when Melanie, after Melanie's husband died, and they moved out of state to Tennessee that she kind of cut grandma off. Like, I guess she used to see them all the time, either every weekend, every other weekend, or at least talk to them, talk to the boys. And then after they moved, um, she completely kind of cut ties with that part of the family, which listen, I know a lot of people, not me, I've got a great mother-in-law, but I know a lot of people who given the opportunity to no longer have to deal with their mother-in-law would take said opportunity, right? Like that's the, the jokes are there. We know how mother-in-law jokes go and that comes from somewhere. But again, this is one person's side of the story and then speculation because Melanie's not here to tell her side of the story because Zach murdered her. Anyways, after a four day trial and only three hours of deliberation, the jury of seven men and five women came back with their verdict and it was a guilty verdict. They had found Zach Davis guilty of the murder of his mother and he was given an automatic life sentence. He wasn't eligible for the death penalty because in that state, if you're under the age of 18, you can't get the death penalty. So it's an automatic life sentence. And he was also given an additional 20 year sentence for the attempted murder of his brother and an additional 20 year sentence for the aggravated arson. The trial court considered what sentence would be quote, sufficient to prevent crime and promote respect for the law end quote, and Zach's quote, potential or lack of potential for rehabilitation, end quote. But it didn't look good for Zach, right? Like it didn't look good for him at all because the judge noted that he was quote, devoid of remorse, responsibility, appreciation for life and potential for rehabilitation starts at ground zero or below. The judge really didn't seem to like Zach, which I don't really blame him. He said that what bothered him the most is that Zach showed no remorse for killing his mother. And it's such a young age. And the judge said specifically, and I quote, you became evil, Mr. Davis. You went to the dark side. It's that plain and simple. The judge also said that during the trial, it showed that Zach was obsessed with death, which could be true. But from what I read, the article I read, the judge kind of came to this determination because of the video games that he played and because of the fact that, you know, he loves Stephen King and horror and he had recently read Misery. And now listen, did Annie hobble Paul with a sledgehammer? Yes. So I can see how that parallel could easily be drawn. However, I think it's dangerous to start lumping people who are into dark things and those interests, again, I said this in the beginning, but those interests being in isolation considered strange enough or connect somebody to being a potentially violent person or a murderer. Because if that was true, if that was what made a murderer, if hor liking horror, make a murderer, make a murderer, make, make a murderer, make. If liking misery and Stephen King makes one a murderer, we would see a lot more murderers up in this bitch because 
I know for me, I love Misery. That's one of my favorite Stephen King's ever, actually. Definitely one of my favorite adaptations into film. And so um, maybe I'm biased, but I'm evidence that it's not the case, is my point. I'm just really trying to drive home the fact that I have never killed somebody, so don't, don't be suspicious, don't be suspicious. I'm brushing my eyebrows with a comb. Okay. In one of my college classes, they gave us like a little bit of like um, a little anecdote about correlation, which I always think about when it comes to things like this. And that is this ice cream sales go up in the summer. Okay. So does the number of murders, but people aren't out there murdering because they're eating more ice cream. So one thing has nothing whatsoever to do with the other. Two things can happen at the same time. Somebody can murder somebody and somebody can be interested, be interested in dark things. But just because both of those things happen do not mean that they are connected. And that's my point. Just because people are out there eating ice cream doesn't mean they're out there killing somebody. Maybe it has something to do with the heat. Okay? Okay. And for the record, Zach was asked <laughs> if Misery inspired what he did to his mother because the book was found in his home. And I mean, he said no. I know his credibility is kind of shot at this point and we don't really trust him that much, but um, for the record, he did say no. Is that true? I don't know. But that's what he said. And he was actually asked, in case you were curious, if he loved his mother. And he said, somewhat. So, Zach's in jail. He has to do a minimum of, it's either 70 or 71 years. No, it's 71 years in jail. Um, because here's the thing. He's given a life sentence. And from what I understood in Tennessee, if you're given a life sentence, you're up for automatic review after 51 years. So he can get paroled at 51 years. But remember, he was given an additional 20 years for the attempted murder and additional 20 years for the arson. Now, the judge ruled that 20 year sentences, these two would run consecutively, but that they would run concurrently to the life sentence, which means he has to serve the 51 years and then start his 20 year sentence, but he only has to do just 20 years, not 20, 20, not 40, 20, because they're consecutive. I hope that makes sense. I, I, I've, I've always tried to explain consecutive versus concurrent. I hope that did it for you. But basically what that equates to is his entire life in prison, right? Because he's 15 when this happens um, and 71 and 15, that's 86 years. That's so crazy. Do something so stupid, so young. And now you're in jail for literally your entire life. You get one life. You're here, you die, that's it. And uh, this is what he's chosen to do with it. It's fucked. And I guess people are glad it's over. A friend of Melanie's, this guy named Sean, said that like there aren't any winners here, but at least now it's done. It's over and Josh can try to move on with his life as well as he can with literally no family. He didn't say that, I'm saying that. He says he's glad he can move on with his life, but I'm like, with whom? <laughs> you know, it's... Anyways, in 2016, Zach, as they do, asked for a new trial. His judge basically said that him getting a life sentence under the age of 18 was unconstitutional because he was a minor and that that is deemed cruel and unusual punishment. We've talked about this before, but that's because in 2012, it was ruled that mandatory life sentences without parole for sentences for juveniles violate the Eighth Amendment um, prohibitions against cruel and unusual punishment. The Supreme Court ruled that its 2012 decision applied retroactively to individuals who had already been sentenced for crimes they had committed as teens. But the decision applies only to life sentences where there's no possibility of parole or no automatic review of a sentence after a period of time. And it was determined that this protection didn't apply to Zach because he was given a life sentence, yes, but there is an automatic review time after 51 years in Tennessee. So he doesn't have life in prison without parole or without the opportunity to be released. However, his attorney was like, yeah, that's true. But if you give him this 51 years and then give him 20 right after that, that basically is a life sentence without the possibility of parole. His attorney said specifically of this, and I quote, the sentence denies any conceivable right to be eligible for parole. His parole eligibility date is September 14th, 2077. I know I will not be around to see that day. And it's likely Zach won't be either. His attorney essentially stated there needed to be a new trial so they could determine if there was irreparable corruption in Zach that made it so that he was unable to be rehabilitated. But if he was able to be rehabilitated, he deserved the chance to do so. 
He also tried to shoot his shot with the competency thing again, saying that clearly his client was not competent to stand trial because of the outburst he had in the middle of trial where he said it wasn't him, but it was his brother who committed the murder. And he also said that that the prosecution saying the statement that Zach wanted to be a serial killer was not based in fact and made it difficult for Zach to get a fair trial. In the end, the judge denied the request for a new trial. And in his denial, he said that evidence during the trial was sufficient for a murder conviction and that questions of mental competency were fully vetted and said that the sentence of life plus 20 years follows the law. Now, a lot of people think that Zach was too mentally ill to be found guilty of these crimes. Um, his competency is a big thing that people discuss, uh, his illness, all of that. And a lot of people, I think it has a lot to do with the way he speaks, right? A lot of people even, okay, I mentioned this the first time I covered this case. Um, but a lot of people think that he is possessed by demons. If you're somebody who believes in the supernatural, a lot of people have come out. That was like a big thing. Reddit, Ooh, Reddit, listen, they think he's possessed by demons. They hear things in his interview, like when he goes to answer and he, it sounds like he says it wasn't me like under his breath before he speaks. I've seen what they're saying, but I feel like this is the type of thing where people are trying to find an explanation for something that doesn't have one. They're trying to find a reason why something this absolutely terrible happened, a way to make it make sense because it's one of those things when a kid kills their parents, that's just hard for a human being to wrap their mind around. Like you have to give it some sort of justification Otherwise it makes it terrifying to exist because that means that this could happen to anybody. But the fact is, is he did it. He tried to cover it up and based on our laws that made him guilty. So that's where the case stands. He's in jail for the rest of his life and his mother is dead. And based on their shared tombstone, it seems like she was buried alongside her husband. And now Josh is left with no family. His mother's dead, his father's dead, his brother's in jail forever. These cases always fuck me up when somebody's left with completely no family. And then on top of that, he has to be left with the knowledge that he was meant to die in that fire, that his brother wanted him to die, and that his brother believes that he did these horrible things to him. And I think that's the saddest part, because like, I'm no mental health expert, right? Mental health expert, sure. Yeah, yeah, psychiatrist, psychologist, whatever. I'm not that, but to me, it does seem like he believes that happened to him. And that's so sad. Cause I mean, he seems to have a fixation on this sort of thing happening in general. I mean, still thinking that the other inmates were going to do it, thinking that the guards did it, we're going to do it right. Like he has a fixation on this. So he really believes his brother did it. And that's so sad. This whole case is really sad. Honestly, it, it does feel like it's one of those things that hindsight's 2020. It does seem like he was a sick kid and needed help to me. And I mean, there's a million reasons why she could have pulled him out of therapy. You know, I feel like people will always be like, oh, she should have done this. She should have done this. She should have known blah, blah, blah. But the thing is, is we don't know what it was like in her position. We don't know what she thought was going on. There's a million reasons why she could have taken him out of therapy for one, they were moving Two, therapy is so expensive. Mental health care is so expensive and complicated and being able to get help for those things in America is, a, is honestly a bit of a rare blessing. So who, who knows what was going on? She couldn't have possibly known he was as bad off as he was, or she wouldn't have done it. Right. I'd like to believe if she knew how bad off he was, she would have got him the help he needed. Nothing about her, no reports about her say she was a bad mother or a non-attentive mother. Everyone says that she was great. So it really just seems like a series of unfortunate events that maybe could have gone differently. Maybe they wouldn't have, but the fact is we'll never know because she's gone and now he's in jail for the rest of his life or the life that he took. Because here's the thing, there is a good chance, like I've said, I believe that he's probably sick, that he probably does have schizophrenia, that he probably was delusional and believed that these things happened to him. But here's the thing, a lot of people have schizophrenia who aren't violent. And it's, it's sad, but true. But a lot of people get sexually assaulted, right? But a lot of these people don't go on to beat their mother to death with a sledgehammer and try to burn their brother alive. Now, <laughs> I know that was heavy, but considering all of the information that I've just given you, I'd like your opinion. And that is this. Do you think that Zachary Davis should have been found guilty or should have been found not guilty by reason of insanity? Please let me know in the comments below. But with that said, 
That, my friends, is the story of Zachary Davis, the 15-year-old who gave one of the scariest interviews with Dr. Phil of all time. I hope you found this case to be interesting and informative, and I hope I gave you all the information you would want when looking into this case. And of course, thank you for remembering Melanie with me today. If you haven't already, please don't forget to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you, specifically you. And if you want to hang out more consistently, all my social media is listed down below for your convenience, along with a link to my merch store and a link to my membership where you can get early access to videos, polls, live streams, things like that. Please do not forget to leave me a case suggestion down below in the comments if you have something you want to see me cover. I put out a new video every week, um, and whenever you leave a suggestion, I write it down on a list, I put your name next to it, so if I cover it, I can give you a shout out. I love covering cases that you guys are interested in. I especially love covering cases that are local to you guys that I might not have heard of before. Um, and I know you're filled with good ideas and good taste, otherwise you would not be here. Now, with all of that said, I just want to thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world that is tight you are tight. Please stay safe and be a better person than you were yesterday, and I hope to see you in my next video. Bye.